there was fear constantly in Guam uh, of any punishment and retaliation or any kind of, of treatment because a whole life depended upon them. So therefore, one of the instructions that my, my father gave us was don't ever contradict the military. Of course, uh, during that period, he was still under the uh, naval administration. After the Spanish-American War, the military that came in to occupy Guam State for 50 years, and it was, uh, we weren't given any, any uh, help from Congress. Governments were completely run by the military, and uh, the governor was uh, commandant of the base, and governor of Guam, he was the legislative, judiciary, and executive. And after, th after 300 years of colonization from the Spanish, American, it, it, it looked like, at that time, just natural, part of our way of life. There wasn't anybody uh, rebelling, criticizing. They better not criticize the governor. So that was in an, it was in our mind. the first stateside building in Guam. The, the Guam Congress building was very proud of that. Built of stone concrete, very attractive. It was, um, cornerstone was laid in 1947, and um, the laying, uh, the breaking 47, completed in 1948. And he was very happy about that, and thought maybe this Guam Congress will continue. Of course, he didn't know that within a, a year, he himself would be out. And instead of Guam Congress building, it'll be the Guam Legislature building under the Guam Organic Act. How quickly it changed after 50 years of Navy rule, after 50 years of military dictatorship, after 50 years of one-man rule, autocracy, arbitrary rule. In just one year, it flipped and he was out and we that for the first time, some voice in our government. I started going to school at the age of eight. Eight to 14 was required. Eight years old before I went to school. That was 1925. So the first school I attended was the um, number one school that later became the Leary School in honor of the first governor of Guam. And from there, I went to uh, the Almacen, A-L-M-A-C-E-N in Spanish. It, it was the warehouse, generally for military wear, uh, supplies, but it was for everything else later on they turned it into a uh, intermediate school, up to the sixth grade. And of course that building was completely destroyed and what remains now is the, um, is the entrance to the building and that became a part of the uh, fence or wall around the governor's palace that we see today. From there I went on to Seton Schroeder High School. I, I took uh, seven, eight and nine there and when I finished uh, the ninth grade, the um, uh, governor of Guam hired me as a school teacher. Ninth grade. And someone said, lesson plan, what the heck was that? No training whatsoever. So the only thing I did was to say uh, simple arithmetic, simple spelling, cat, C-A-T, dog, D-O-G, and two plus two is four. And if somebody misbehaved, I'll hit him with a ruler. I learned that from the other teachers. Oh, there were a lot of punishment like that. And the thing about, about that is that uh, uh, in spite of the fact that the, at that time there may be 21,000 Chamorros, there were only uh, but a little over 50 of us that graduated from the ninth grade. So see, there was, education wasn't widespread. And uh, years before that in, um, 1925 and 26, I have pictures of, of the graduating graduating class of the sixth grade 
which was the highest at the time, out of a large population. Most people didn't go beyond third, fourth, or fifth. And the thing that struck me about that picture is that these women and men, the men and women who graduated from the sixth grade were in their 20s, already in the 20 years old or more. So I'm just trying to emphasize that there was really, the Navy kept saying, we cannot give the Chamorros citizenship because they haven't developed yet. They haven't be, become Americanized enough. And they need more training, that kind of thing, but there wasn't any. In 1936 is when I did, uh, started planning to go to Hawaii to visit my brother and go, go to school in Hawaii. In the spring of 1936, my father asked the naval governor for permission for me to, uh, to board the USS Shawmont. He paid $13. But before he gave his permission, he said, what does that boy think the Navy boat is, a bull card? And we got that permission through my uncle A.T. Paris, Atanasio Titano Paris. They, everywhere, they, was, they weren't encouraging us to, to go further in our education. Anyway, I, um, I got myself this uh, ticket. It was a steerage class. I was down on the bottom of the ship with hundreds and hundreds of soldiers and sailors returning to the United States from duty stations in Manila, China, and Guam. But I was seasick all the way to Hawaii, and now, before I left Guam, we didn't know anything about the outside world, the American culture, how the youngsters like me at the time, how, what did they, how they went to school, what, what did they learn, how, how they sang, and, because we were not Americans and we were doing the Chamorro stuff. So when I reached Hawaii, it was just full of surprises. Um, I was amazed, shocked sometimes. Uh, they talked differently, dressed differently spoke English differently. They thought that I was, I came from an, uh, an English school in Hong Kong, maybe. They, they thought they were hearing a British accent. I had no idea that a ch bad Chamorro English sounded like, like, like the Brits. And I graduated in 1941 from the University of Hawaii. And while I was attending uh, the University of Hawaii as a graduate student, Pearl Harbor was attacked. So all of a sudden there was martial law, uh, rationing, censorship, rounding up of possible uh, traitors, the Americans, but perhaps aiding Germany or Japan. There were quite a few of them, perhaps maybe almost a hundred that were rounded up. And so I went around and, and, and looked for a, a, a job. The university was closed. So I was hired by the Honolulu Police Department as an assistant police chemist. After some time with the police department, I said, uh, I think I want to be a part of the, of the military unit that would be returning to Guam to recapture Guam. So I went downtown to the Dillingham building and talked to the uh, U.S. Army Intelligence Unit. I said, oh, yes, we need you. You can speak the language. You're from there. You know the people there. Go ahead and volunteer, and then they'll train you, and they will use you. So I volunteered. I went to ba uh, basic training at Schofield Barracks near Wahiawa. But after our basic training, we were ordered to and shipped down to a transport going down under to MacArthur. And I was screaming that Guam is that way, not, not south. So when we got down under, I went to the inspector general. That's the guy we go to, enlisted men, who complains. I told him, I, 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 I volunteer for Guam. What am I doing down here? He said, uh, number one, you're just one of about 11 million of us now, both in Europe and the Pacific, fighting Hitler and Tojo. So really, to, to emphasize that your problems are not, not that important. Number two, you came from, from a command under Nimitz, and you're now with MacArthur. These guys don't even talk to each other, so forget it. So I asked for permission to appear before the division board to go to officer candidate school. At that time, in, in mainland USA, you could go to OCS for nine, 90 days, three months, and they, they were called 90-day wonders from private second lieutenant or from civilian. That's the wonderful thing about it. That was approved, and they sent me down to um, officer candidate school 
and uh, Ipswich near Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. A lot of ants in the field. <laughs> so this way I went from an officer, candidate, school training. You are uh, referred to as a candidate, so I became candidate Titano, but nobody pronounced my name properly. It was always Titano. Candidate Titano. Sometimes I don't answer because it wasn't my name. They called me out to uh, give a bata the battalion a series of marching drills. Forward march, about face, to the right, all that business. And, and then I looked to my left and I saw a bunch of high-ranking officers taking notes. I said, this is the end. They're going to send me to back to New Guinea or the Solomons or Peleliu or someplace. I didn't know until later on that they were testing me to find out whether I was qualified enough to be a member of the faculty. So after graduation, the uh, orders were cut for me to be assigned to officer candidate school. I became a member of the faculty. And uh, discrimination was in the military in those days also. And there are a lot of soldiers who were Portuguese, Hawaiian, Chinese, Filipino. But in the school, I was the only instructor who was not of European descent. So when that was, school was closed, I was ordered to, uh, to the Philippines to participate in the, in the battle there because it's still going on. I was assigned to uh, Tagaytay up in the mountains, south uh, near Manila, somewhere near Manila. There's still a lot of Japanese up there. I was up there when finally we heard that uh, some strange bomb was dropped at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the war is over. So we started celebrating, and then they sent me down to, um, to uh, Paranaque near Manila to the reception center there. They were, uh, they had this center organized to receive European civilians who were prisoners of war in Japan. They were not Americans. And we provide them with everything from drinks to stockings to clothes, purses, suitcases, everything on their way to Europe. I'm saying that now because I found out later on that Archimore people in Guam weren't, they weren't given that same treatment and yet these people I, that we served were, were not even Americans, but they were Howleys. It, it's just amazing how a country behaves in something like that. Well, then war is over now, so the army started sending people back to the where they came from. It was based on how much time you had overseas. Of course, with me, everything was overseas. I was starting in Hawaii and still in the Pacific. I was eligible. But first I said to my commanding officer, I want permission to go to Guam to see my folks. This was 1945, a year after the liberation of Guam. I want to see my family before I go back to Hawaii, he says, granted. So I flew to Guam on a, on a, on a military plane, and I was looking down to Guam, I couldn't recognize anything. Mountains were bulldozed. There were 200,000 troops at the time getting ready for, when well, they were getting ready to invade Japan, and then Japan quit. It was still there and a lot of thousands of civilians too. Airstrips I didn't know, camping sites, and especially the, the, the depots where they had supplies, military supplies all over the island. And then I landed somewhere in, in, in Anderson, one of those air bases, Northwest or something else, I don't know. Then I requisitioned a jeep, you're an officer, you can always get those things. And I went out looking for my father. Of course, I was asking Chamorros all along the way, do you know who, who says in a class Titano, Kwetu? No. Keep asking somebody else again, getting closer and closer to Aganya. Well, try Aganya Heights. So I went up to Aganya Heights at the property of Maria Gutierrez. That's the grandmother of Governor Gutierrez. They own a property there, back there. And I parked my jeep and looked, and I saw a thin, undernourished man it was my father. Next to a hovel, a hut he built from tin and wood he collected from devastated Aganya, with the ground as the floor. Where's the help from Uncle Sam? And I wondered at the time, who was the enemy? Nearby was a Japanese stockade. They looked very healthy, smoking American cigarettes, eating American ice cream. I said, isn't that the enemy and my father was one of us? An old man like that, uh, this should have been 
some sort of help. Washington didn't appropriate any money for the to, to meet these people. As I said so many times, there were 33,000 Chamorros crossing the lines, enemy lines from Japanese to American. Can you imagine 23,000 American citizens, white citizens, how least, crossing the German lines into the American lines in Europe? Liberated? My God, all of America will celebrate. They'll probably send every plane from America and bring them home and there'll be parades. Nothing like that. They treated Chamorros like the other Pacific Islanders, the other Micronesians, even though we were with them for almost 50 years by that time of the war. But very sad. And I'm glad that all of that is gone, but that thing keeps coming back. And it was at this time, too, when I started planning that when I get out of the service, and we'll get out soon, I'll return to Guam and plan something to change that government. There have been over 29 bills and resolutions before the United States Congress. All failed. We even sent two of our leaders to a very, very, very famous and good president, President Roosevelt, to plead with him. Nothing happened. And so I've been thinking about that all the time in the service. Well, another petition will be just simply a waste of time. We petitioned 1902, 1917, 1936, and after a lot of people, soldiers who served in Guam, they returned to the mainland, they asked their representatives to introduce a bill to save those people. People in Washington, there's the Institute of Ethnic Affairs, there's the Guam Echo, many people. N nothing. Even the president says, ordered the four departments to start planning something. We're going to do something with this island, but nothing. The Navy, either the two powerful or the rest of Congress and the president believe that uh, military matters tops anything else. The Navy kept telling them that, the, that giving them citizens, the Chamorro citizens, would imperil the mission of the Navy in the Western Pacific. I can never see how that can happen because if you bring them in, they'll, they'll be more loyal, as we are now, more helpful, give you more protection. But that worked with the, with the, with the military all these years. So I started planning. And I said, another petition was a waste of time. I'd have to create an incident of such magnitude that it would be published by the newspapers, that would attract the attention of the president, the Congress, and the American people. But how can I do that? If I do that in Guam, some sort of disrespect, defiance, disobedience, we would just be thrown in jail, or maybe simply just scolded like in the past. And if I'm just in Guam, nothing will happen. So I, I, for many years in Hawaii and in the Army, I recognized the power of the American press. Very powerful, even today. You know, it can change uh, the next president, can change Congress, majority in Congress. Very powerful. I said to the two newsmen, w are you willing to help me? After all that story about, first of all, going back to the beginning of time when, uh, when, um, the, when the Spaniards came and destroyed our culture and our population reduced it, and to the treatment by the naval government, they agreed. But I said, what are you going to do? Are you going to shoot the governor? I said, no, nothing like that. This is going to be peaceful. But are you willing to publicize it all over the United States? And being AP and UPI, it would be all over the world. Yes, provided you do one thing, is that what? It's got to be ex exclusive to us. Oh, that's easy. I can do that. I won't tell anyone. Not, and I stuck to that. I didn't even tell any newsman in Guam about it. Um, I kept quiet about it again, waited for, for, for uh, the opportunity. Then I became, I ran for a seat uh, of the, of the, uh, in the assembly from Mangilao, where I was living. And that's where I met, by the way, the two newsmen. And then in 48 following year, the, the, our Congress started and then went about the daily routine of, of an assembly. Nothing spectacular. I kept look, waiting for this. Something's going to happen. I don't know. I didn't know what population, business, situation in Guam. The Navy rule at that time was this. No one is allowed any business license but only Chamorros 
to give them chance to to um, develop, to come back to where they were before the war. But a lot of Americans, either in the service, out of the service, were using Chamorros as fronts and bringing merchandise to Guam and selling it. So the committee discovered that a, a guy by the name of Goldstein was the one really who owned the, it was a clothing store in Mong Mong. And so, uh, like any other legislature, we thought we, we had the, 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 the authority to do it. The committee issued a subpoena to Mr. Goldstein to appear before the committee and, and tell us what happened. He simply came and told the committee, you have no right to order me to appear here. I'm an American citizen. And the governor agreed. And of course, he was right. We didn't have any power. Only Congress can give us that power. But we thought we'd, we'd try it because we had checked with the uh, attorney general of the uh, Navy, Commander McKinney, and said, you go ahead and do it. The governor thought otherwise. So I said, that is it, what I'm looking for then. So we got, uh, after that committee hearing was, well, it was never, never, never went on because the guy didn't want to appear. We got together and said, this is a big slap in the face. This is humiliation. This is all kinds of things. And of course, everybody was fearful. It took a long time. We talked, 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 and someone says, uh, how about this? They talk about retaliation. The cause is important enough, and if we suffer a little bit, I think it'd be okay. There were 36 members of the Guam, of the assembly, the lower house of the Guam Congress. The upper house was the House of Council. And one member was in California, Manuel Guerrero, who later became governor. And the other one who refused to walk out with us uh, was with the Navy Insular Force previously, or Insular Guard. He didn't want to leave. He was very loyal to the Navy. But it's not a matter of loyalty to the Navy. It's what's best for the Chamorro people. And I tried to, to explain also, this is not really an attack on Governor Pornal. It's, it's the system. If another animal is placed, it'll be the same thing. It is the their system of government for Guam, where the President of the United States just turned it over to the Navy, run it any way you want to. That's how McKinley turned over Guam to the United, Na United States Navy. So finally, 34 agreed, and we walked out. And then um, the governor said, I want you back there in your seats. I'm going to give a talk to the upper house and lower house. We didn't attend as the second defiance. Then he said, you're fired. You're all fired. We should had the authority, of course. But we were saying, of course, governor, previously you said that uh, we have a right to elect our assemblymen, and you're you deciding. So finally, the, the that... 34, the 34 assemblymen agreed to walk out, as I mentioned. And, and then we didn't attend the meeting that he was calling. And they said, I'm going to appoint my own assemblymen. But he didn't know Chamorros. We went around to all the villages. And all the potential assemblymen, people, leaders in the different villages, we approached them. If the governor asks you to serve, say no. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. He was asking people all over the world, turning him down. Then a wire came from the Secretary of the Navy, cut out this appointment, called those people back. Boy, that's not a tremendous loss of face for the Admiral. He had to call us back. I lost the game. So we went back. Anyway, they, as I keep saying, that wasn't the important thing. It was the system. And I stopped after two weeks sending information to AP and UPI. I thought I had done damage enough to the United States of America already. And I ought to learn that it is, was already in Washington Post demanding fundamental reforms in Guam. I read the New York Times, Washington Post, Christian Science Monitor, and our neighbors in Hawaii, the Honolulu Star Bulletin Advertiser, were comparing us, our movement here to the Boston Tea Party and the Stamp Act, movements toward freedom, liberty. I said, I'm sure it'll be a successful uh, uh, campaign. President Truman was so disturbed that said, he didn't know really that, he knew that Guam was on the military, but that there was so many dissatisfied Chamorros. So he ordered the State Department to investigate. I want an answer from you quickly. They came back quickly with just one short sentence. Mr. President, unless we give them government, they're going to continue to be radicalized. So quickly, he started to move. In a few months, 
He removed the, the Admiral Ponard from his post and placed a civilian person from the interior. He still, still under the Navy. And the change of administration was to take place the following year, 1950, from the Navy to the interior. And he started lobbying in Congress, this time for real, pass it. Not like the other bills and resolutions that just, they talked to Chamorros and they I'll do you that favor and introduce something and it didn't go anywhere. The first time I heard that this was passed was when one of my friends, this guy was from the um, Associated Press, he phoned me. It's pa it passed. Well, how do you feel? He wanted something great to put down <laughs> in his uh, coverage. And I couldn't think of anything that, was, that would be historic, <laughs> that people remember. I just simply said, oh, my friend, thank you very much. That's great, it's great. <laughs> N no, uh, nothing coming out of Roosevelt or, or some of the early fathers of the Constitution. It was as plain as that. I was just really just very excited and, and, and happy that he had succeeded. Then I got an invitation from President uh, Truman to come to the White House to witness the signing. And there were a lot of Samoa leaders who really helped. I've got to keep emphasizing that. Everybody helped. But it was, they told me when I got to Washington that what did it was that embarrassing that you did, embarrassing thing that you did. It was hard to embarrass the United States around the world. That did it. It said, just without that, we, we won't give you the Organic Act. I say all the time that we were liberated from the Japanese in 1944 but liberated from dictatorship, from autocracy in 1950.